So I'm thrilled to have Attila Piantec with us today. Attila is the Vice President Exploration of Allbridge Mining and is a professional geoscientist with over 15 years of experience in the mining industry and economic geology research. So he's been leading his team's exploration efforts, which has led to discoveries that established the multi-million ounce potential in the Fenelon Gold system. So he'll be chatting with us today about gold exploration under thick glacial cover, blind discoveries in the Northern Abitibis detour Fenelon Gold trend in Quebec, Canada. So it's gonna be a great session. Please use the chat. We'll open up the floor and have discussions at the end. And yes, thank you so much Till, for joining. It's wonderful having you. Yeah, so thanks again, again everyone. And uh, yeah, big shout out to the Warbridge Exploration team up at site and at, at home. So, um, all right. So, yeah, it's not going to be a promotional talk, but I think uh, you know there's going to be probably some some arm waving in there that that could give it, get me in trouble. So I just put in a couple of disclaimers from from the company. Um, yeah, so I'd, I'd like to go over you know review a little bit the exploration trends in terms of gold, which a lot of you are probably familiar with, but just to sort of see how that affects our exploration strategies that, that we can choose as explorers and then introduce you to, to Norton Abitibi, which, which uh, you know, there's a lot of challenges uh, operating there, but I, I, I hope I can convince you that there's a lot of opportunities in, in such belts as the, as the Norton Abitibi. And then I'll walk you through a bit the Fenelon discovery story, which was really an exciting last three years of, of drilling off a new, new major gold deposit. And and then maybe we can we can talk about exploration methods, uh, you know, learn a little bit from this Fenelon discovery, and I hope that's going to trigger some some discussion at the end. If, if we can we can talk about uh, you know similar belts and how to how to explore them. So, you know, I'm going to be drawing a lot here from Richard Shetty's work, of course, which which a lot of you know uh, from Minex. So. You know, the gold discoveries are, are, are becoming deeper and deeper. So the depth of cover is increasing, especially in the brownfields uh, discoveries, as you can see here. Not so much for the, for the greenfields ones. So there we still find, uh, find uh, deposits exposed on surface. And, uh, you know, just as an example, Francois Robert gave a talk, of course, uh, you know, a month ago, and he was talking about the Carlin trend, how again gold dis discoveries are still being made. They're they're big, but they're they're getting increasingly deeper. Um, another trend that we can see, which also sort of speaks towards the maturity of a lot of these search spaces that that we explore in, uh, is that the deposits are getting getting smaller. So, uh, you know, over the years. The deposits are, are are getting smaller, and again, it's it's it has to do with with the maturity uh, that we're exploring in brownfields areas, and we're sort of uh, looking at uh, down the food chain, looking at smaller small deposits. Uh, so this and some of these other some some other factors contribute to the fact that uh, the discovery cost for gold is uh, is is increasing. So every decade. It's becoming more expensive to find gold, and um, you know I don't think it's it's uh, it's necessarily. I mean, you could argue that that uh, us explorers are also getting more lazy or, or not as good as our at our job, but it probably has to do a lot of, with the fact of of uh, of where we actually exploring. So now some of the good news is is uh, you know if we do go to depth. Uh, there's still a lot of really good discoveries to be made, uh, even in the mature camps. So here you can see quality of, of the project. So if you just go a couple of hundred meters uh, uh, below surface, there's you know the 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 quantity of or the proportion of of tier one, tier two assets is is much higher than than near surface, uh, and then and the value of the discoveries therefore is is higher at depth. Uh, again, that sort of talks to, to uh, uh, the deeper search spaces haven't been depleted yet. And um, so most of the value in the deposits is near surface because that's where we're looking, but there's a lot of untapped potential uh, at depth. So just a, you know, a couple images here again, pretty neat uh, uh, visuals of, of talking about these exploration maturities of, or, or, or how um, 
how less, uh, you know, how few drilling there is actually at depth. So you can see here uh, about 1% of the drill holes goes uh, 300 meters or deeper. And, you know, now this 300 meters is, is considered basically, uh, you know, very shallow in terms of mining. Uh, now, just to note that, that a lot of this is probably quite skewed due to the uh, assessment work requirement, you know, filings and, and mature mining camps. Of course, a lot of the data uh, is proprietary, so people don't have, you know, companies don't have to file this information anymore. So, you know, it's, it's probably skewed, but that's kind of the best data we have. Um, and so once, you know, when we go to, when we go to depth, the, the exploration methods that we have to use change a little bit. So uh, here near surface, of course, the geochemistry, uh, prospecting, mapping play a key role. But then as we go to, to depth, uh, really uh, geophysics, which is in red and, and drilling are the, the main, the key exploration methods that we can use. And, um, and then maybe I'll, I should, you know, I'll emphasize that, you know, so ge geological interpretation, conceptual targeting, and of course, extrapolating from known mineralization are still uh, key even at, at depth. And we'll look at that in, in later in the talk. So, um, so what does that all mean for us in terms of uh, how do we adjust our exploration strategies? Where do we look? Uh, how can we sort of be better uh, or face better odds? as explorers. So sort of traditionally, we have two ways of exploring. One, one is, you know, we stick to mature camps, uh, go deeper, so, so keep drilling deeper, or we sort of reconsider historic mines, like it was done here in Canada with the Detroit Lake and Canadian Malarctic, where, uh, you know, they used to be uh, underground mines, and now they're some of the biggest uh, open pit gold mines here in, in Canada. So that's sort of the brownfields approach. And then the other one is, of course, you know, you open up new exploration frontiers. Uh, so you can go to uh, places like northern Canada, uh, African countries, of course, you know, Guyana and, 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 and some of the Asian countries sort of open up new search spaces. And some, some of those uh, are actually quite exceptional, even here in Canada, like Newfoundland, for example, is an area that has seen a lot of grassroots exploration lately and has 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 really sort of revitalized uh they used to be mining in that area but but now it's it's sort of a, a really new green fields area that that is, is giving good results so i would sort of argue for for a third approach um, um is is sticking to world-class belts but go a little bit undercover and and uh, that's sort of grassroots exploration in the shadow of the the head frames we we'll call that so there's a lot of benefits of of that so there's obviously you know as explorers we always try to sort of eliminate not eliminate but but mitigate risk and and, and you know exploration is very risky to begin with so as much as we can mitigate that risk uh, reduce it the better so you know, sticking to, to world-class belts gives you proven potential geologically, uh, lowers your geology risk. It's usually mining-friendly jurisdictions, better access, uh, logistics, quicker timeline to development. So, so you know, less geopolitical and, and, and development risk. So that's sort of the, the premise for, for, uh, for what I want to talk about in the, in the Northern Abitibi is you know, I really like this image here of, of one of our drills at, at Fenelon. It sort of sums up a lot of the challenges that we're dealing with in, in this belt. Of course, you can see uh, there's absolutely no outcrops, a lot of wetlands. And, um, but, you know, in the next slides, I'll, I'll, I'll show you that there's a lot of opportunities there that really make it worthwhile. So, you know, this is a map that a lot of you would know, the, the Abitibi Greenstone Belt. So, of course, uh, over 180 million ounces of, of past production just in this southern part of the belt from Timmins to, to Val d'Or. And um, not so much in the northern part. So there's about 13 million ounces of past production. And, uh, you know, really, uh, uh, geologically speaking, 
there's really not not much of a difference. Um, you know, you can argue that the rocks are slightly older; they're about 10, 20 million years older. But I think, you know, without wanting to be too dogmatic about it, I, th I think you know, generally it's the same geologic processes, so there really shouldn't be much reason for for uh, the endowment to be to be much lower. And we actually see that, you know, with places like the Beetle Lake, which has over 32 million ounces of endowment. So really world-class potential uh, in this part of the belt. Um, there's really no difference in, in, uh, in access or seasonality of exploration. So, um, you know, I've heard before that uh, really the main deciding factor or, or the, the main factor in influencing where mines occur is really the distance from from Toronto and and Montreal, and um, you know that's just kind of jokingly, but um, you know when you look at opening up a wilderness like like northern Canada, that's obviously a, a, an important factor how, how far you are from the main uh, uh, business centers. But for example, Shibugamu uh, has been around for a long time, and it's, it, it's further away. So there's now, I think there's there's other factors there, and and I would argue strongly that um, uh, the main reason is still geological, but it's 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 much younger. It's actually Quaternary geology, so it has to do with the with the overburden thickness. And uh, you know this is a beautiful map from from the Visual Capitalist, which shows the the overburden thickness, and you can see here in the southern Abitibi and and also Shibugamu area. Um, there's a lot of outcrops, really very thin overburden cover. But then when we go to, to these areas here, Detour Lake, uh, there's 20 meters plus, plus overburden. This area is actually called the, the clay belt here in, in Ontario. And, and this is very similar here in, at Detour. So um, you know, just kind of zooming into the, the more interesting areas there and, and driving home that message is, you, can, you know, you can see here the outcrops in that southern Abitibi, over 100 years of, of mining, over 100 million ounces of, of known endowment, and uh, you know lots of lots of outcrops, uh, lots of outcropping gold mineralization. Now, in contrast to that, the belt that we're in, um, you know, really just a handful of outcrops, and not really in the more interesting areas. Um, it's usually in the in the sort of granitic late plutons. Um, and, um, yeah, so obviously exploration is, is way behind in these places. So just kind of looking at this maturity and, and how it relates to, or how it was affected by the, by the outcrops. So here on the left side, again, um, uh, the map surface outcrops density, uh, on, on the Quebec side here. So lots of outcrops in these areas and, and sure enough, you know, the early prospectors uh, up to 1920, that's where, you know, Noranda, Valdor, Shibugumu camps were, were found uh, 100 years ago. And then in the next decades, they just followed up on that, continued locating the other mining camps that are still in operation. And now we're also, you know, there's also diamond drilling, but it's really all about prospecting and, and diamond drilling. And then then comes the next era, which really uh, was a huge sort of the modern area of, of, of exploration when, when the airborne uh, uh, geophysics was invented. And here's a here's some nice uh, nice uh, uh, articles here from from the end of the 1940s and early 1950s, where they're talking about the modern magic carpet and uh, wing divining rod. Uh, so uh, you know. It, as you can globally, um, you know, globally, it, it, it caused a huge bump in, in discoveries, being able to um, uh, see these deposits on, under some, you know, a little bit deeper buried. So that's when, uh, that's when we're starting to have some deposits now in this northern part. And initially, most, mostly the BMS camps were found, of course, on the more sulfide-rich deposits. So you've got metagamy, jutel, salbe, uh, but then there's also some gold deposits like Detour Lake, uh, Sleeping Giant, um, 
which still occur with sulfides. So they, they were good, uh, good EM conductors. And then there's actually the Eagle, Eagle deposit, which is where Ignico Eagle's uh, name comes from. That was their first uh, gold mine actually here. So, you know, and then in the next decades, again, still airborne EM, MAG being the, the key driver for a lot of the new discoveries. Uh, so Kazabardi, for example, in this area, and this is a nice map from, from 1994. It still shows how back then there was really not much, not much known in the area. So there was the, there were the VMS deposits. So this whole area was sort of considered as a, as a VMS camp and the few, few gold deposits. So Detroit Lake was pretty modest in size back then. And then, and then Kazabardi and, and the Eagle mine. And then Fenelon was actually, they just got into the first intersection of, uh, uh, good intersection in, in what ended up being the Gabro zones, as I'll, I'll show later. So just kind of trying to quantify a little bit, a um, little bit this difference in, in expiration maturity. Um, similarly to what we've seen there, uh, Richard Shuddy doing in Australia, uh, you know, looking at the whole database of, of, of that's, that's filed with the OGS, uh, the Ontario Geological Survey and, and the, the Quebec Cision, uh, adding, adding our databases to it. Uh, you know, just looking at a little bit of differences between the Northern and Southern Abitibi. And uh, you can say rough, the, the area is roughly the same. So, so Northern Abitibi and, and Southern is, is roughly the same size. Uh, you can see there's, there's more than twice, twice as many drill holes in the database for the Southern Abitibi. Um, a lot of those holes actually don't have gold assays, so I think that's a combination of a lot of holes actually not being assayed for gold because people were looking for base metals or just, or just the data missing from, from the database. Um, and then you can see if we just go down 300 meters uh, drill hole length uh, or, or seven, you know, 500 meter vertical depth, uh, drastically uh, less and less holes. This is still much higher than what we've seen in, in, uh, for Australia, which again, I don't know if that reflects a reality of, of, um, of uh, how it was you know, really explored, or is it again, just a matter of how the different uh, filing systems are maybe for uh, uh, assessment requirements. So, you know, but if we focus in on, on these areas of, of interest there, Comparing it, you get more than four times the drill holes in, in this area than, than, than in, in, in up here. And again, the same note that, that I mentioned in Australia, I think a lot of these are really skewed. Um, I mean, that's the best we've got because that's the publicly available data. Uh, obviously, all the, all the other data is proprietary, but you can already tell from the fact that 77% uh, of these drill holes was actually drilled before 2000. Uh, in, in, in this Ruan Baldor area uh, really tells us that most of the exploration that's being done recently is just not being filed for, for assessment because you know, you're in, in mature mining camps and, and existing deposits. So all that drilling is not being, being recorded. So kind of summing up that image into this one to diamond drilling density map uh, really highlights again how this southern Ebitibi lights up with a lot of drilling being having been carried out. Uh, and then in the Northern Abitibi, it's sort of more localized to Metagamy, uh, Jutal. So there's a few centers where there has been a lot of exploration. Also here, Shibugamu, but then there's this huge areas with, uh, with barely any drilling. So in recent years, uh, there has been quite a bit of exploration now. Um, and there's some significant discoveries being made in, in the Northern Abitibi. So a lot of you would have heard of Cisco's windfall uh, and, then, and then some of these other deposits um, uh, that have been drilled off in recent years. Uh, I hope I'm not forgetting any of the, the bigger ones here. And then, and then Fenelon and, and Martinier, which combined right now, we have about 4.4 million ounces. So that's that's what I'll be talking a little bit more about today. Uh, 
so yeah, I think uh, you know these these recent successes are really starting to show uh, demonstrate the potential that that's here. So I'll walk you through a little bit the the Fenelon discovery story. You know, it's been a very exciting time for for Wildbridge in the last three four years, drilling this off. And um, yeah, I think it's just a really neat discovery story. There's lots of lessons to be learned. Um, you know, kind of just the story of how we got involved in this whole area. Uh, you know, we were made the first acquisition six years ago. It was a really small property. Uh, it was we just focused on, on on a historic showing that existed there. Uh, but we really liked the location because there was sort of this flexure. Uh, in the main deformation zone, uh, pressure shadow of this uh, so-called Jeremy Pluton. So it looked like a good place. And uh, you know, we went through a series of, of discoveries, um, which I'll talk about. And that sort of generated a, a momentum for us that allowed us to, to go back to the company uh, Balmoral Resources that we did the original purchase from. And we acquired the whole company uh, and then did an option agreement. For, uh, and, and that basically allowed us to control uh, about almost 100 kilometer strike lengths of this, of this land package. And then we can, you know, follow that following up those discoveries. We ended up just in November um, uh, coming up with a maiden resource estimate. So that's sort of uh, in a nutshell. And, you know, looking at it geologically, uh, obviously, with this much uh, overburdened cover in the belt, uh, geologic interpretation is pretty challenging, and, and it's really driven by mainly by magnetics, uh, where there's airborne mag and, and a little bit of drilling. So you can see actually in the in the Cisrion, the uh, geological survey, it's still a pretty simple uh, uh, geology map. And then here on the right hand side, you can see a much more detailed interpretation that was done by the consortium, which is a uh, consortium of mineral exploration research, which, which I'll talk a little bit about. Um, you can see there's much more detail, uh, but basically, like I mentioned, the main factors are that, that there's really a nice flexure. Um, there's sort of secondary structures coming off of that. There's this nice pluton. Uh, you're in the pressure shadow of that. And, and there's, there's all the other ingredients that you really need for orogenic gold deposits, like a sedimentary basin uh, and different intrusive, uh, mafic, ultramafic intrusive suites. So, you know, it's a really an ideal location. This is a bit more uh, recent, the more detailed map that where we're starting to bring in some of, some of the uh, stuff that we learned from our drilling. You know, really not going into details here today too much. Um, because this talk isn't really focusing on the Fenelon rocks, but that's sort of our, our, our host rocks here and, and, and the rocks that we're mainly encountering, these graphitic argillites, this will be a bit of a part of the story. So you know, this is really what we inherited when we came into here. Um, so that was the, the, this main gabbro, which was the only known host rock, these, these gabbro zones. So everybody was sort of focusing on, on a 200 by 200 meter a uh, small area uh, that was drilled off. So there was a small resource there near surface. And uh, so that's that's where we went in underground and we actually took a bulk sample there. Beautiful, nice high-grade mineralization. You know, it's, it was a lot of fun and, and, and really understanding the mineralization. And you can see these shear zones, uh, super nice the high-grade shear zones and then very sharp boundaries towards the, the barren uh, gabbros. So that's sort of what that typical mineralization uh, looks like there. And so from there on, we did a lot of, sort of conceptual targeting, uh, figuring out how can we find more of these. Uh, the mineralization was only known down to about 200 meters. And so what we did is we, we were sort of projecting down the rocks, the, the, the known structures, and sort of conceptually looking at some targets where these, these zones could blow out at, at depth, for example. Uh, so that was basically, you know, about four years ago. So within four years, this is how it looks like now, just as a reference. Uh, you know, now we have a resource estimate down to about a kilometer. Uh, and uh, we have this Jeremy diorite, this brown rock, which we had no idea that it existed before. And um, 
interestingly, the the same areas where we we thought there was, you know, could be mineralization conceptually, uh, end up having a lot of good mineralization, but because of totally different reasons. So that's just kind of a nice uh, nice coincidence there. So, you know, how did we so make these discoveries? So, um, apart from from geologizing, we used we used magnetics and. This, there's this mag, mag break here, which which really caught our eyes, um, sort of being subparallel to to these gabbro zones. And if you notice, all the drilling has been done here, sort of going from the south to the north, you know, towards the northeast. And this is this is all behind it, so we have no idea what 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 this actually represents. So what we ended up doing is is we turned the drill around. And, and we set up here, drill it right through the known gold system. And then let's just keep drilling until we get through that mag low and, and see what it is. And sure enough, we got into some really weird rocks and lots of continuous gold mineralization, which looked very different from, from what we used to at, in, in the Gabbro zones where I was showing. It was very sort of uh, narrow shear zones. Here we got you know, basically 100, 150 meters of continuous of low grade mineralization with some higher grades in between. And then we followed up with this. This was really sort of confirming the, the discovery here, this other, uh, you know, this next hole. This was really drilled. We just got into this before Christmas um, of 2018. And then early 2019 is when we, when we went back with the drill and, and followed up. And, uh, now, these are some early cross sections when we were starting to get the first results and, and we really had no idea what's what's going on with every drill hole we were we were learning about the geology. Um, yeah, there's 20, 25 meters of overburn. So it's really just a blind discovery where uh, we got into this this new host rock type, which we uh, which we thought it's part of the Jeremy Pluton, called it the Jeremy Diorite. And we were seeing this sort of continuous mineralization. And this was that whole 52, which I mentioned, sort of uh, uh, that really confirmed the discovery. And we were starting to sort of piece together. It was really, you know, exciting times trying to understand the geometry and, and orientation of mineralization and, and understand the host rocks. And, um, you know, basically for the next few months, with every new drill hole, we were, we were gaining some new information. and and sort of building the building the story like that. Um, so some some pictures of the of, of these new mineralization styles and so some beautiful mineralization of uh, of high grade uh, you know lots of visible gold, lots of sulfide, silicified shear zones. So that's sort of what what our Tabasco Cayenne zones look like. And then Area Fifty One, which was actually forgot to mention that, but that was named after this. Discovery hole, hole 51, and we really had no idea what we got, so we, we ended up calling it Area 51. And um, yeah, that's sort of a vein system of, of uh, that's hosted in, in the diorite. Pretty similar mineralogy like, like the shear zones, but sort of more uh, discrete veins that form these uh, vein corridors. So a few more, more photos here. I think these are the only rock photos in the talk. So I'll, I'll, I'll stop here a little bit and uh, let, you, let you enjoy some of the nice textures. Um, so yeah, so basically we went, within a couple of years, we went from, from this to, to this. So we realized that uh, instead of the Gabbro being the main story and, and, and um, being the main control, it's actually this Jeremy diorite, which is the the more dominant controlling host rock, and 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 uh, and basically the, the 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 contact of that is is the really strong control on the mineralization, and we realized that the Gabbro zones were just really a small satellite to to much larger gold system. So along the way, like I mentioned, we acquired Balmoral, so that gave us a, a nice buffer. And, and we acquired with that the, the much larger land package. And, and then just at the end of last year, basically after three years of, of, of drilling this off, about 300,000 meters of drilling, 
Uh, we came up with this uh, maiden resource estimate. A lot of it is actually in the indicated category, so that, that gives us a lot of confidence in, in what's there. And the mineralization is really nice and compact, so it, uh, it was really efficient, the cost-effective drilling. And you know, we haven't done an economic study yet. That will be sort of the next step. But just, you know, we're really looking at underground bulk mining as a, as a very efficient method. You know, when we look at uh, uh, about 2.7 million ounces of over three gram per ton, uh, very nice ounce per vertical meters in, in that deposit. So that's sort of an eco economic scenario that, that might be uh, what we're going with in the, in the economic analysis in the, in the future. And, you know, it, it keeps, keeps growing. So, as I mentioned, we have it down to about a kilometer now in the resource estimate, and then we have one drill hole that goes below that, which hit the exact same uh, rock types and, and uh, mineralization styles. Uh, and then, you know, going about a kilometer away, and we have this Ripley zone, which, which, uh, which is starting to shape up as a nice satellite zone. So this, this, this is our, still our focus, and we continue to grow it. And then now we're looking at some of these other deposits like Martinier elsewhere on, on the belt. So kind of moving on to talking about exploration methods and how do we, how do we really explore in these types of, of belts? And um, I think you know, there's probably gonna be a lot of uh, discussion points there that, that, that will be applicable to, to a lot of the people in the audience you know, exploring in other belts. Uh, of course, Australia it has a lot of experience with with undercover uh, exploration. I think you're you're a few decades ahead of us in Canada, having had to do uh, undercover exploration. So, we're kind of talking about a bit of the exploration strategies. So, how do you explore such a large land package effectively? And these are some of the facts. Like you know, it's it's over 100 kilometers uh, strike length. There's up to 100 meters of overburden, uh, average 20, 30 meters. And, and we know that there's three large gold systems uh, combined 36 million ounces. So how do we, how do we uh, explore this efficiently? I think you know, what, uh, one of the main things we, we always face uh, as explorers is, is the opportunity cost. So you know, every, every dollar we spend, every day we spend in one place, is taking it away from from some other place. So we really got to figure out how to focus in on the on the right places. Um, so I think one of the there's a few few ideas here, but you know one is is is, is the business model. So you really got to figure out as a company. Hopefully you're not a promoter. There's like we said at the beginning. There's a lot of a lot of those in in Canada, and they they destroy a lot of uh, credibility. Uh, but there's 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 a bunch of other uh, ways you can strategize, you know, and move your company ahead. So you can be a grassroots explorer, try to make discoveries like like we did at Fenelon, or you can be a project generator. And then Francis uh, McDonald, he gave a good talk there last week about that um, approach, where you assemble a portfolio of different projects and, uh, and and try to attract partners to explore them. Or you can be a developer, for example. So you can you can focus on one flagship, like our Fanlon, for example, and try to uh, develop that and, and bring it into production. So you got to have sort of sort of a business model in mind. What is it that that you want to do with the company? Uh, you know, I think you really got to have a defined target in mind. So what commodity are you looking for? What size, grade, depth? Uh, so in our case, for example, like we do have this grisette deposit, which is a quite nice uh, nickel deposit, uh, five and a half million tons of one and a half percent nickel equivalent. But um, you know, we we realize that we really have to focus on on gold. We can't get distracted by by different commodities. So we're finding different ways now of of trying to uh, uh, move that grisette project, for example, ahead. Uh, but that's always a danger. I mean, as geologists, we just get uh, excited about all kinds of other shiny, shiny metals that we might find. So, but you got to sort of focus on 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 uh, what your what your goal is. And then similarly, I mean, every company is going to have different size thresholds or or what depth they're looking for. Are we trying to find an open pit or underground mineable? 
uh, deposit. So it's going to be different for for each each company. Um, so then you can apply some of your mineral systems or, or sort of geology uh, interpretations. And so you want to be obviously familiar with some of the analog deposits, uh, but you really have to watch out that you, you know you don't get dogmatic and and um, rule out certain areas just because it doesn't fit some some deposit model. So like we talked about, I think eliminating, you know, a lot of what we're doing in exploration is just trying to figure out where not to uh, look anymore. So try to uh, condemn areas, eliminate areas so that you can quickly focus into your, your highest uh, potential areas. So you want to find methods that cover large areas sort of quickly uh, and expensively. And then another point maybe to make is, is you know, you can share the risk and, and, and costs. So try to join the venture and, and find partners. Uh, of course, the project generator model is all about that or, or, or you know, dominantly about that. Uh, in our case, you know, we decided, for example, that this Detour East property uh, is just too far away for us to, to explore um, uh, in a meaningful way, it would be expensive, and, and uh, it's much closer to the Detour Lake mines. So we let, we let Igniko uh, come in as a JV partner and we let them operate it. And, and so sort of, that way we share the, share the costs of exploring in the area. So, um, so how do we, you know, sort of look at, looking at what kind of exploration methods we, we have available, uh, trying to classify it and, and make a fun game out of it. But um, basically, you know, kind of to this point of, of eliminating large areas quickly and expensively. So looking at some of these metrics of, and, and no, I'm just going to use here the divining rod as an example of, of how I'm playing this game here is, is so, you know, I haven't used it much, but I would say it's probably pretty high on the obscure mumbo jumbo scale, but it's, it's very cost effective. You're just going around with a, with a branch. Um, and, but it's pretty slow and, and the depth penetration is, is, uh, is not much. Now, if you go to to mapping or rock sampling, you know that's that's I would I would I would say that's that's direct observation. And that's probably the best data you can get. But again, it's pretty slow. Death penetration isn't all that good. Um, now you're getting into some some till soil sampling, so you're getting a little bit closer to to uh, uh, you know losing your reliability of data because you're not directly sampling the bedrock, so you got to do some interpretation of, of your uh, data that you're getting. Um, but you can see probably a little bit deeper, a few meters or, and um, so then we're getting really into the domain of, um, of uh, uh, you know, these kind of studies that uh, surveys where you're really sampling a medium that's that's further and further away from the bedrock. You're sampling water or uh, uh, the soils that, that are further away from the bedrock. So, you know, it's really up to a lot of, you know, there's a lot of room for interpretation there. And, you know, obviously I don't, not, not to offend any, any service providers or I'm also not paid by any service providers, but you know, I think we all agree that that a lot of this is is um, it, there's room for for a lot of interpretation, but there's uh, you know the depth penetration is now a little bit better. Maybe you can see a, a few tens of meters down, depending on what method you use, where where you are. Uh, so then you're getting into some of the geophysics like airborne mag. So now you can penetrate really deep. Uh, it's really fast, so you can you can cover large areas quickly. Uh, cost is obviously a bit higher, and, and you can, again, it's, there's a bit of room of how you interpret it. Uh, IP, similarly, maybe less depth penetration, less speed, um, higher cost. Now, again, I think people at home, uh, um, there would be probably a lot of, a lot of uh, you know, we can have a lot of discussions on where to place these 
these dots and and it's you know it's a lot of subjective uh, and, and you know experience and and what which deposits which ones work but that's sort of from my experience this is this is what we're seeing and then you get into the to drilling because now you're getting into you know direct uh detection you know, it doesn't really get much better than that uh, but it's pretty expensive uh, but you can drill as deep as you want and then if your project is really in a in sort of a very advanced stage then you can get into some some excavation drifting bulk sampling which is very expensive sort of off the chart uh, and you can go as deep as as, as you want um, now I, I would really you know put some other methods in here which maybe you know you wouldn't think as exploration methods but like you know i feel very strongly that doing in-house you know having an in-house team do geoscience interpretation is, is some of the best exploration that you can do and then there's there's economic geology research and you know ai prospectivity analysis which again depending on uh, how you do it who does it what's the data input it can have a big range of, of reliability uh, and uh, and usefulness. Um, so yes, yeah, so I'm I'm not going to go through all the methods, and you know, there's obviously no time, and 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 so I just want to look at some of the methods that we have experience with in this belt, what we learned, uh, and yeah, hopefully we can have some discussion at the end of, of what worked for other people, and and uh, so you know, really at Fenelon. So what were the key factors? So we had an existing small gold zone, uh, which was key. And we've seen that also from Shuddy's graphs that of course, that's always a important factor if you have if you have some known nullization. Now, not all the known intersections turn into large gold deposits. So, so what else were some of the factors here at Fenelon? So one was did a lot of geologic interpretation, conceptual targeting. Um, so for this one, like I was saying, you know, I. I'm really strongly, um, uh, you know, I feel really strongly that having a an in-house geoscience team is is key. You know, like we've seen, like our geologists being really the passion, enthusiasm is is you know, it's really uh, your own geos that that make these discoveries, and you know, arguably, uh, uh, you probably get better consistency of data collection. Uh, so it's the same people. Uh, trying to ensure that 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 the data is collected the same way you you call the rocks the same uh, you sample the same way and, and all that and then there's the continuity of of in depth knowledge of the local geology that again it's it's really uh, the in house team that can sort of uh, have that now uh, you know, again nothing against consultants um, you know obviously consultants uh, play a huge role in 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 uh, in the success of projects, but I think it's it's best if you bring them in for some of the specialized tasks where so some of the niche skill sets that lack in your team. So in our case, for example, uh, uh, we brought in, in some consultants to establish underground green control. Uh, structural geology is always a bit of a challenge. You, you don't always have that in-house. Geophysics, of course, uh, you don't necessarily have a geophysicist in your team. So some of those, uh, you know, establishing a QAQC routine protocol. And then, uh, you know, we, we also feel very strongly about supporting economic uh, geology research, especially in a belt like, like ours. Like I mentioned, it's way behind in terms of exploration. So similarly, research is, is really far behind. We barely have any age dates, no structural uh, geology framework figured out yet. Uh, so, you know, we at Wabich have been have been always supporting a lot of research projects, and we really believe in sort of the embedded projects where uh, it's a, it's geos that work for the company or you know and, and know the geology already well. They're the ones who then take on some PhD projects or, or MSCs. So we've got some collaborations with quite a few universities. Uh, and also the concern, which is which is that consortium of, of mineral exploration uh, that I that I mentioned. So, kind of moving on to you know we mentioned airborne magnetics being really important in the in the discovery. So, 
I mean, a lot of people use use magnetics, and that is definitely a key in in these belts. Uh, so, so this this was the mag that we had available at the time when we made the discovery. So you can see that nice mag right there. But then since then, we collected some really beautiful high resolution drone mag. You know, much tighter line spacing, closer to the ground. So now you can do some really uh, fancy interpretation of the structures. Uh, it really maps the whole structs. This, this Jeremy Dyer here, for example, and you can look at the folds and you know analyze liniments. So that you know we really found that mag mag was the most useful geophysics uh, for us, definitely in this in this area. Uh, and learning from that, now we're applying that regionally to other projects. So going east of Fenelon, trying to find satellite deposits in this Grisette area, and then also uh, near Martinier, uh, we're, we're interpreting structures based on the magnetics and discovering some new gold bearing, bearing structures. So again, magnetics being, being super important for us. You know, the other airborne EM, we already talked about you know, a lot of the early discoveries, uh, obviously having been made by that. Interestingly, Fenelon was actually discovered because of a, uh, which is, it, it actually turned out to be a sulfide horizon in, in, the, in the sediments, uh, which is barren for, for gold, but then the, the gold zone happened to be beside the, the sulfide horizon. So um, now it's probably still very important in the story, uh, because we we see the same actually at Martinier. We're seeing these graphitic sulfide rich arch, argillites occurring right beside the gold mineralization. So even though they're themselves they're not gold bearing, we think they had lots to do with sort of reducing the fluids or, uh, or you know a bit of a chemical trap. So that continues to be obviously a good good exploration method. Um, one thing that really worked for us is is oriented core drilling. Um, you know, again, not, not having any surface exposure, the only way we can get reliable structural geology data is, is through oriented core. You can see here the disks of the, of the structural measurements and then really figuring out, establishing the structural controls, uh, so the lineations that control the shoots and then, and then putting together sort of the structural story. So, um, and then, you know, having had the success with, with oriented drilling, we're, we're not actually applying that to Martinier and elsewhere regionally uh, for the first time. So even in our regional drill holes, we're, we're using oriented core. Uh, and you can see here the disc, for example, in this, this drill hole uh, lines up perfectly with so these mag breaks and, and, and IP, uh, the foliation maps the IP really well. So. Uh, it just works so much better in understanding the, the structural uh, story, even in, in a very early stage project. And then the last thing so we, that helped us a lot was this underground exploration drifting and, and bulk sampling. Now, of course, this, like we, we said, this is pretty expensive. You only commit to these kind of things if, if you already have a deposit. Uh, but you know, it was key for us to go underground really map, touch and feel these, these zones, um, you know, back in 2018 and these Gavril zones. And then we did the same thing now early this year, we went into area 51 and, you know, we were able to validate our, our geology models, confirm the continuity of the veins, uh, so test mining methods. So again, it's sort of really key when you don't have surface exposure that you go on the ground as soon as possible and, and try to look at these rocks. Um, you know, just touching a little bit on till sampling because we actually didn't, didn't do much, uh, but um, you know, recently there have been some really good discoveries uh, done by, by uh, till sampling. And again, uh, Francis from Kennerland from last, you know, last week's talk, uh, uh, this was one of, the, one of the better discoveries in the last, two, three years, and then of course, Rupert resources. Uh, so in our belt, uh, uh, you know, again, we're a little bit challenged to use till because it's, it's tens of meters thick. So what happens is uh, you can see here on the left side, uh, there's, there's a lot of different uh, glacial events, the, the glacial uh, um, directions that 
get superimposed on each other. So you have different pill layers that record different uh, orientations. So uh, it takes a bit of uh, effort to figure that out. Uh, if, if you get these dispersion halos or plumes, how they, how they actually point back to the source. Um, but you can do this, this sort of sonic drilling where you, where you drill through the overburden and you sample all the layers. And, and if you do a lot of careful systematic uh, grid drilling of that, you can start putting it all together. So we actually haven't used this method yet, but that's something that I think has a lot of uh, promise in, in the belt like, like ours. Uh, one thing that we've, we've, we've tried, and if you remember, I, I put this pretty high on the mumbo jumbo scale, but uh, you know, in our, in our group, there's a lot of debate amongst the geos of, of, of uh, interpreting this and how well it works. Uh, but there's definitely some, some pretty positive uh, preliminary results. So, you know, sampling uh, black spruce tree bark, the idea is that the, the roots go deep enough uh, that they tap uh, the water table coming off of the mineralization and they, they might actually, you know, roots might go through some of the clay clay layers and it's actually pretty neat the the um the uh, depending on what metal you're looking for you, you need to sample either the outer bark or the inner bark because different metals get concentrated in different places uh, and then you have to focus on, on, on collecting the same type of trees uh or the thicknesses of the trees so it's a bit of a science and, and there's a lot of experimenting going on and we really don't know yet how deep it can see you know does it deep three through does it see through 20 meters of overburden? Does it see through 50 meters? We have, we have no idea. So that's why we're, we're, we're trying this method right now. And, and here, for example, so, so silver over, over uh, lead uh, ratio, now this seems to correlate quite well with the, with the great shells. These are the gold great shells at Fenelon. Uh, and then especially if you just look at the near surface great shells, you know, they seem to match up quite well. And it makes a lot of sense. We have a lot of silver in our, our deposit and, and lead is a little bit uh, further away. So that makes a lot of sense. And then also copper, uh, we're getting some good, good copper anomalies uh, near the mineral or at the mineralization. Now, these are the metals I'm showing. I'm not showing the other metals that, that didn't really work that well. Uh, but I think it's, again, it's, it's a fairly inexpensive uh, you just need some you know, people uh, driving around with skidoos um, and, and sampling the, the bark. It, it's a fairly inexpensive method that, that could be uh, quite useful. And then I think this is the, this is the last slide. Um, you know, this is again, a, sort of a very experimental uh, study, but this was done by the Constrm and they, um, they actually uh, uh, used Fenelon as the as this um, uh, as their case study site, and so here they're sampling water uh, in in the drill holes. So you need to have some existing drilling, but if your drill holes are several hundred meters away from each other, um, and they can they can analyze the uh, the metals at very low concentrations. So we're talking about really uh, uh, minuscule uh, levels, and, and the, the, the results were actually quite, uh, very promising. So here, uh, gold, uh, silver, and copper all uh, showed the, the heart of the deposit. And then, and then arsenic was actually more broadly dispersed, which is exactly what we see from the, from the mineralization. So again, a, a pretty neat method that's quite new being developed by this, this group and, um, and, and starting to be applied. So, um, yeah, there's, I think I, I went already quite long and uh, really no time for a summary slide and just you know, covered a lot of different topics. So uh, I think hopefully everybody found some, some takeaways and um, yeah, I'd like to thank you for your attention. And uh, yeah, hopefully there's gonna be some, some questions and, and, and good discussions. Thank you so much, that was, yeah, really cool story. So thank you for sharing with us.